Okay, let me start by talking about why this topic is important. Um, in Silicon Valley, which is where I'm based right now, I mean, I'm, I work with Elaine over here, but I spend most of my time uh, outside traveling. But um, in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of myths about what constitutes an entrepreneur. The, uh, you know, John Doerr, uh, who's supposed to be one of the greatest venture capitalists of all time, is famously quoted as talking about uh, how they do patent recognition. And he also talks about the fact that they love founding, you know, the typical successful startup is founded by a young, brash, white male. That's the, the typical um, stereotype that they have, and that's the, that's the belief that they have is that it's these young, you know, white, brash males that make successful entrepreneurs. And the problem is that that's what they fund. And, and it's sort of a, a self-perpetuating thing. I'm going to be talking about my research on entrepreneurship. I'm going to start off generic to start with. I'll talk about three research projects we did and then get into uh, follow-up research we did and the difference between men and women entrepreneurs. And I'll share my observations about some of the challenges that women and minorities face in Silicon Valley. Okay. First of all, I've, I've worked with a bunch of academics, including my friend Ben Rissing over there, who's now at MIT. He's local if you ever need to do, get more information. We've been looking at uh, different aspects of entrepreneurship. We did three different research projects in which we surveyed the CTOs of, uh, of you know, different technology companies. We looked at immigrant-founded uh, companies. We also did a detailed survey of um, a series of high-growth companies outside tech to see what the differences were between tech and non-tech. Now, disclaimer, and then the following few slides, I'm going to jumble all these data up. I mean, Ben is going to freak out on me, I know that, but that's okay. Because I'm not trying to give you an academic presentation, I'm trying to uh, basically share some ideas and get you thinking. That's the purpose of this, uh, this talk. So again, if I mix and match data, forgive me for that in advance. Okay, now let's start with some of the myths. As I said, the, the, uh, the biggest myth in Silicon Valley is that tech entrepreneurs are unmarried, male, rich, college dropouts, you know, obsessed with making money. I am adding the word rich over here because that's another perception about tech entrepreneurs. Bill Gates, you know, what do you think? Comes from a, a rich family, uh, you know, white male nerd. So that's the stereotype of, a, of, a, of an entrepreneur. And this one won't go over very well where I am, but also that Ivy League education provides a major advantage. And it, I'm sorry to be calling it a myth. <laughs> <laughs> and I get very popular in, venture, in uh, venture capital land when I talk about the fact that venture capital isn't a prerequisite to, uh, to economic growth. So I'm going to discuss these topics. First of all, here's what we found, well, here's what we learned. The tech entrepreneurs typically aren't young. The average age of a tech entrepreneur is 39. The average age of an entrepreneur in, in uh, the high growth industries we looked at is 40. Big surprise. They tend to be married and have children. If you look at these charts, um, they typically have uh, you know, more than one child. And the vast majority of them are married. Can, at the time of founding their other companies, yeah. So again, just these two slides, slides over here, uh, based on there is something wrong with the myth. Let's keep going. They don't come from rich families. You know, this this is actually intuitive. Until uh, about a decade ago, you would not have thought of an entrepreneur coming from a rich family. You would have expected them to come from a middle class family, from a working class family. Because why do you start companies? Because you want to rise above poverty, you want to rise above uh, your uh, your heritage, and you want to basically make it big. That's also called the American dream of of making it big and uh, striking it rich. You know that's what capitalism is all about. That's the American way. So the fact that the majority of them come from um, the lower end of the spectrum should not be a surprise. But when people see this slide, they are surprised. Right? Tech and entrepreneurs also tend to be very highly educated. Only 6% of them didn't have bachelor's degrees in, in our sample. The vast majority of them have, uh, have a diverse set of degrees. It's just not computer science that makes a tech entrepreneur. It's, uh, it's a diverse set of, uh, of, um, of, uh, you know, of, of fields of study that they've, that they've undertaken. This is also not surprising that um, tech entrepreneurs tend to be uh, better educated than their parents. 
I mean, this is also to do with immigration. It also has to do with um, uh, the changing nature of society, that um, the education level of, of people who are rising to the top is quite high, and it's higher than their parents. This is not a surprise. <laughs> now, I'm joking a little bit in the title of this one, but what we found interestingly was that um, the most successful, this is based on the sample of successful entrepreneurs who had launched companies which uh, achieved a certain size. That they did very well in high school. They were uh, you know, at the top of the class in high school typically. But when it came to college, they didn't do that well. So my, my theory over here, not based on fact, based on personal experience and anecdote, is that they drank too much in college. <laughs> now, why are the young interns all laughing when I say this? Uh, you're, you're not trying to disprove me, are you? <laughs> Now, this is another interesting, uh, interesting chart. We looked at the, um, the number of jobs created and the revenue of startups, and we compared them with the Ivy League. Right? We found was the difference between having um, a degree and not having a degree was huge, statistically significant. But when you compared the average, which includes you know, both groups, with the Ivy Leaguers, the Ivy Leaguers didn't do that much better in the companies they founded. So in other words, it's great to get a, a Harvard MBA, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be a more successful entrepreneur. In fact, I've written about this in, um, in a couple of articles. Uh, based on all the data, that I, based on all the anecdotal information I've gathered, it may well be that getting the, uh, the leader education makes you more likely to want to become an investment banker than an entrepreneur, and makes you less motivated if you're an entrepreneur. If you think about it, if you're graduating from uh, some third-rate university, um, <laughs> in Massachusetts, you're more likely to be motivated to succeed and work harder and take less for granted than if you're a Harvard MBA. So this is what uh, these data showed. Another uh, you know, myth that uh, entrepreneurs tend to be very highly educated. On average, they had uh, much more than six to 10 years of experience. That very few started uh, companies right out of college. In the zero to five year category, where it's 24.6 percent on this chart, if you took the zero years category, it's, it's a small, it's a tiny fraction of, um, of the successful companies that have started. <clears throat> Another interesting chart, that uh, entrepreneurs aren't necessarily from entrepreneurial families. Coming from an entrepreneurial family uh, makes you more uh, likely to become an entrepreneur. The, the, the um, members of entrepreneurial families are overrepresented in our sample, which means that uh, if, you, if your parents were entrepreneurs, it, it's likely that you become an entrepreneur, more likely to become an entrepreneur than, than, than the average. On the other hand, half of the uh, uh, successful entrepreneurs we interviewed were not from entrepreneurial families. What this means is that anyone can become an entrepreneur, really. That's the way I interpret this. Reasons for becoming an entrepreneur, there's a very uh, you know, wide set of reasons. It's, you know, people think that um, uh, most of these uh, the tech entrepreneurs are because start companies because they're unemployable. They're so brash and uh, uh, you know, so apart from the rest of the world in their ways that they can't, get, they can't take real jobs. That's false. In fact, that was the lowest factor that we found for starting companies. It was more likely that they always wanted to start a company, that they got tired of um, working for others, Startup culture appealed to them, and so on. Based on my analysis of um, all the data I've seen, based on lots and lots of research and, uh, and knowing entrepreneurs and being part of the system myself, my conclusion is that um, what happens is that people have been working for large companies for the first 10 to 15 years of their lives. They um, gain lots of experience, real world experience. And they get ideas on what they can develop that will make an impact. They also have savings. They get married. They have children. Their children uh, reach a stage that um, that they're still young. They're not, you know, they're, they're not going to college at this stage, because once they start going to college, it's a big financial drain on the whole family. But there's a point in between when the entrepreneur comes to the stage that they're tired of working for someone else, and they say, "Okay, I've got to make it big now. This is my last chance. I'm 40 years of age. If I wait another 10 years, I'll be over the hill." And that's the stage at which they start companies. And all the data that I've seen, like I said, confirms. That, um, that view. 
So another interesting data point, we asked entrepreneurs uh, where they got their money, where they got their funding from. The vast majority used personal savings or they got it from family and friends. This sample included sale entrepreneurs as well as first time entrepreneurs. When we looked at just first time entrepreneurs, only 9.8% of successful first time entrepreneurs raised venture capital. The proportion that raised uh, angel capital was 9.2%. In other words, 92%, 91% of the entrepreneurs did not raise venture capital of successful entrepreneurs. This is from the uh, sample I talked about in which we interviewed successful companies. So, you know, regional planners uh, uh, go on about how venture capital is a prerequisite to economic growth, and venture capitalists hype the heck out of it. They put out, uh, uh, paper, you know, they put out these papers every year in which they claim credit for, I don't know, 2.1 trillion dollars of economic growth, 12 percent of the economy. God knows what statistics they come up with. What they do is that they look at um, any company that ever received venture capital and um, add it up, they add up the total cumulative market cap and uh, so on, and they say we, this, this is the result of venture capital. So in other words, if um, John Doerr bought Bill Gates' lunch in 1985, the venture capitalists would claim success for the credit of, uh, for, claim credit for the success, success of Microsoft. Right? So the view of venture capital and angel capital is distorted, that we tend to overestimate its significance. The reality is that if you go and meet most successful companies, very, very few of them raise venture capital. And when, when they do get to a point that they're going to be extremely successful and they need to scale up, that's when they go to the venture capitalists and that's when they're successful at raising venture capital. That's how the system works. It isn't that VCs go around uh, uh, looking for you know, bright young kids with ideas and hand them money. That's what you read about in uh, the Silicon Valley press and those are just the outliers. So there's just a rare few cases of companies that happen to succeed. Even Mark Zuckerberg uh, from Harvard had built Facebook and gained significant traction before the venture capitalists started throwing money on him. If, if, if Facebook had not gained traction, there would have been no funding for it. This is um, from the sample of uh, uh, successful companies in high growth industries. It's beyond tech. So what we did, did basically was companies that made it out of the, out of the garage had r real revenue, had, um, a, a, you know, we were, you know, basically looked at companies that were typically year, zero to five years old and that had um, uh, significant revenue. Significant. significant, I think we were looking at the one to five million dollar range that they got, basically made it out of the garage. So five million, that's successful. Yeah. Is that revenue or net profit? No, we were looking at revenue. The revenue, headcount, there were a number of factors we looked at. I don't recall the exact details. Maybe Ben can enlighten you on some of these. This include restaurants? No, no, no. This was high, uh, companies in high growth and series of high growth industries. But I worked with Kaufman Foundation on this. What they did was that they gave us a list of uh, industries that they considered were high growth, where you know, which would basically make an impact on the economy, and we worked backwards from that. Then we went through the one source databases, tried to identify successful companies, took a random sample of them, and and interviewed those uh, those entrepreneurs. Use the criteria of only tech companies and only companies that got me to go public. Would the numbers be significantly different? Um, only companies that went to go public, you'd probably find that more. That have gone public. That have not gone public. That have gone public. And I think you'd find much more, uh, much more, many more venture capital uh, uh, funded companies, because to get to the scale that you can go public, you have to, uh, you require more investment, later, typically later in your life, and a, a lot of. Um, um, Venture capitalists come in at the last second before, uh, before an IPO. They take their mezzanine rounds. And that's when Goldman Sachs and the investment bankers come in. It's just before the company is about to go public. So that data would be distorted. They like risk. Yeah, they like risk, exactly. Yeah, that's the point where there's no risk anymore. That's right. But, it, it, but there's no exit? I mean, a lot of success is yeah. on an exit. So there's, no, there's no liquidity no, no, event no, in any of this. No, 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 no. This is not that subjective on the successes. So um, basically what we wanted to do was to get a, a sample of entrepreneurs that had made it outside the garage and that were building companies that looked like they had attraction without judging the companies. We didn't want to get into this. We, we, did, we did ask lots of questions about the revenue and, and so on, but we, have, we, have, we basically didn't try correlating it back. We, we can do that. We have the data set if you, ever, you know, if you ever want to look at it. <laughs> so if you excluded the mezzanine round and only looked for the startup money? We looked at young companies. If you exclude it, the mezzanine route, right. and only look at the original startup money. That's a good, good question. I, I don't know what the answer is. That would be a great study for someone to do. 
That would be a. Um, uh, this is about two years old now. Right. Right. Success factors. We were more interested in, in, in you know, what the opinions of the entrepreneurs were than anything else. For example, we asked um, uh, the entrepreneurs what they believed their strongest success factors were. And what they told us was that um, it, it was uh, their previous industry work experience, lessons they learned from successes and failures, the management team. One big surprise to me was luck, man, you know, good fortune. In fact, uh, we, we had an open category there when we, we, we didn't, you know, I mean, I didn't put anything about God in there, but I was amazed that dozens and dozens of entrepreneurs put God, good fortune, oh. luck, faith as success factors. Well, uh, you know, a lot of these entrepreneurs, like I said, more than I expected, valued um, luck and good fortune. Right. Did you um, by any chance measure religion? No, we didn't. I, I didn't even think of asking this question. It was just happened that, that some professor said, well, why don't you put uh, good fortune as one of the, the factors that we did. And I was surprised that it was, it was the third strongest factor, really. It was management teams, um, experience, experience management teams, and luck it was, it was the third strongest factor in what we, what we found. Big surprise. Who would have thought? <laughs> but the least important factor was the system provided by the state of the region. Entrepreneurs didn't seem to care you know, about... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. We actually did break this down by state. And I don't, I don't recall the Massachusetts data. Right. <laughs> then we asked entrepreneurs what obstacles were faced by their colleagues who didn't become entrepreneurs. Again, if you, if, you, you know, if you accept the fact that they come from the workforce, well, for every person that starts a company, there are probably 10 that don't start a company. Why didn't, they, why didn't they follow the trails and become entrepreneurs? And the strongest factor here was the uh, amount of time and effort required. It's hard. The uh, financing, experience, and so on and so on. This was an, an, another interesting perspective. What stops other people from uh, becoming entrepreneurs? Essentially, the strongest factor is uh, you know, willingness to take risk. That uh, this is why people don't start companies, that they're afraid of failure. Uh, they, uh, they're worried about the time and energy required, and um, it's hard to raise capital. This is what stops people from start, starting companies. This is mostly a domestic. This is United study, States, right? yes, yeah. yes, all US based. I'm going to switch gears now. So, we, we did a series of studies, you know, um, lots and lots of data. You, you know, you're welcome to read through them and uh, critique them as you like. Uh, but we did all this research, and then uh, I wrote uh, a series of articles about the dearth of women because I moved to Silicon Valley a year ago. And I started, I went to one event in particular, um, a TechCrunch event, where I noted was that of, of 100, 150 people on the stage, the only women were the organizers. Mm -hmm. There were no women entrepreneurs there. This was the young, hip, Silicon Valley crowd. Mm -hmm. And after that, I was sitting there with my wife saying, you know, where, where are the women? There were absolutely no women on stage, which is a big surprise. So I wrote about it, and I started researching it. And I was amazed at the fury that my articles caused, that um, I started getting hate mail like you won't believe. I started getting indirect uh, messages from friends of venture capitalists who started saying, you know, Vivek, you're becoming ex extremely unpopular uh, in Silicon Valley. The types of comments, I'm, uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, so temper this. Um, um, uh, so some male, males are underrepresented in the ranks of strippers. Have you researched those? Um, are you going to get laid as a result of these studies? OK, I mean, all sorts of abusive, nasty comments, one after the other, started coming my way. Um, not on the open, I mean, but on the other hand, uh, soon after this, I had a number of venture capitalists go on Twitter and declare that every uh, single article Vivek was, was ever written is garbage. They disagree with all my posts. They wouldn't attack the women directly. It was all indirect. And I've been getting, uh, you know, I, I mean, I write lots of articles. If I go to the comment sections, every time I mention the word women, slammed with all sorts of anti-feminine uh, 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 you know, rhetoric. And I, I didn't realize there was such a problem in America. I didn't realize there was such a problem in Silicon Valley until I started hyping the heck out of it. So as a result of that, I wrote several other articles and I've become even more vocal on the subject. But what it tells me is that there is a real, real problem over here. And then the folks from the National Co Coalition for Women in Information Technology came to me and asked if, we could, if they could reanalyze some of my data to look at um, the difference between men and women. 
we had lots of it. I gave them all the spreadsheets and the data sets, and they started analyzing it for me. And we published a report um, a, a couple of months ago in which we looked at the difference between men and women entrepreneurs. So I'm going to give you a quick summary of uh, what we learned. First of all, uh, the estimated age. Women were slightly older than the men. You know, the average age of the men was 39-ish. Women were 41. I mean, but still, with it, not, not statistically different. The, the sample of women was relatively small here. So it was statistically insignificant. Uh, women, you know, basically were more or less the same as, as uh, you know, marital status as men in starting businesses. They tend to be married and have children. They tended to be even more educated than the men were. This was significant. That um, they, you know, they they had uh, uh, higher education and stronger credentials than men typically did. Okay. And then we looked at the, the motivations, and there wasn't a significant difference. Um, you know, both groups talked about um, uh, you know work experience, lessons learned from success and failure. A lot of similarities. The only significant difference were that women talked more about um, getting encouragement from their partners and um, in the business networks, basically. They, were, they, they received, in, in, uh, getting encouragement to become entrepreneurs was more important for women than it was for men. I guess men are macho, it doesn't matter what anyone says, they know better than anyone else does. Women take it more seriously. But the, the bottom line was, when we looked at this, uh, it was, I was surprised. I, you know, I, I told the NC WIT people, I said, what, where's the story here? It, it, women are the same as men. And they said, Vivek, you don't seem to understand. That is the story, that they're remarkably similar. Okay. We compared the uh, difference in sources of the funding. Uh, personal, personal savings played a greater role for women than they did for men. Uh, business partners were a lot more critical to women than they were to men. But uh, you know, on almost other factors, they were quite, quite similar. Again, this sample was successful entrepreneurs, and uh, you can't read too much into into you know the fine details over here. But we were just looking at at the big at the big patterns. We asked about the challenges faced. Well, women, uh, you know, felt a lot that uh, the, the amount of time and energy required was was, was a significant difference. Um, the other big difference over here really was about um, the family pressures, that men faced a lot less family pressure to get a job than women did. No surprise. Here's a summary of the differences. Uh, business partners were more likely to have given women uh, 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 funding than, than males. Both sexes had about the same reasons for becoming entrepreneurs. They had the same life circumstances. Women were more motivated to become entrepreneurs when co-founders recruited them. Both sexes faced the same obstacles. And women faced, um, uh, like I said, greater pressure from the family to keep a traditional job. But these are not big deals. I mean, there was no you know, uh, earth-shattering uh, revelation here when we compared men and women. But look at the, um, the, uh, the data. I mean, women const constitute 50% of our population. <laughs> Yet, they start only 3% of the tech firms and 1% of the high-tech firms in the United States. When I say high-tech firms, those are the Silicon Valley types of web firms. 1%. It's pathetic. There, if you look around the ranks of chief technology officers in Silicon Valley, you can probably name two or three. I, I know them all. But beyond that, you don't see very, very many CTOs. Of women. Of women, yeah. Women are basically absent in the ranks in the executive ranks. Look at the uh, management team of Apple. You won't see even one single woman in the entire management team. And that is the norm in Silicon Valley, that they're just not, they're just not present in the ranks of, uh, of, um, of senior execs. They contribute to an insignificant number of, pa of patents in uh, IT and in open source. And uh, the proportion of women uh, receiving venture capital has dropped quite dramatically over the last few years. I'm not sure about these numbers, but the numbers I saw were 9% going down to 3% of venture capital going to women. Okay. And the data for minorities is even worse. Um, in Silicon Valley, uh, blacks constitute only 1.5% of its workforce, and Hispanics constitute 4.7%, despite them being a significantly larger part of the, popu of the uh, population. 
so I mean, on this presentation, I'm focusing on women, but um, blacks and Hispanics in particular have it much worse than, um, than even women do in, in the Valley, if that's possible. Now, this is despite the fact that um, women-led companies tend to be more capital efficient than male-run male companies. They spend their money a lot more wisely. They, they raise it less, uh, less aggressively, and which means that they have to be smarter in the way they run their businesses. Uh, they produce higher revenues than do male-run companies. <coughs> companies that have women in the top, uh, uh, women in uh, top management achieve 35% uh, higher you know, return on equity and 34% uh, uh, better uh, return to shareholders. These are pretty astounding numbers. If you look at the, uh, the data of girls going to schools, they, you know, girls are now doing as well almost as boys are in math and science. The, in fact, uh, women are overrepresented in, in uh, many, uh, uh, you know, many fields, in, you know, science and technology related fields in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the tests and schools now. So something is wrong over here when you have half of the population which is equally qualified not being able to make it or achieve any success in, uh, in the tech world. Benjamin? So, excuse me. Do you view this as a structural constraint within the entrepreneurial environment in the United States? Or could this just be that women are disproportionately sorting into different occupational categories? So within IT or CS, You've only got, say, hypothetically 10% of the, the workforce in the United States being women, yeah. and this gets reflected in the, the startup founding rates for women okay. back then. I'm done with the slides. Let's get into discussion mode right now. I'll, I'll tell you what, what, my, uh, uh, what my perspectives are over here. That um, It starts with, um, with the stereotypes in school, that uh, you know, girls wear pink, boys wear blue and red, and any other color that they want, they're macho. Parents basically start programming the girls to believe that they, you know, they can't make it in the tech world, or they, they can't become scientists and engineers. That they belong in these type of professions. The Barbie dolls versus the guns. It starts with that, and then as as they get into. Um, uh, in How do you explain half of them are keeping women now? What's that? How do you explain that half of all undergraduates are women now? MIT is an outlier. I mean, uh, MIT, uh, you know, MIT is not representative of the rest of the United States. <laughs> And they That's for sure. <laughs> 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 and they have a female imagine. president as a technologist. Well, come on. Because that's what matters. Because MIT can choose to be great. That would be the right thing. So it starts with the um, with the encouragement that they receive, and then when you get into high school and college, engineering and science is not cool in the United States at all to start with. It's a problem that uh, the engineers are the nerds and the geeks. And it's not cool to get into these professions. So it's bad enough for guys that want to do it. They can take uh, peer pressure better than women can. So, so that's negative encouragement. And then when they do join the workforce, they're also held back. They're also, they also don't reach the senior positions. They're not given the, the mentoring and the encouragement. They lack the role models. That, um, uh, you know, one of the things which has surprised me is how few women that have su succeeded help the ones behind them. Mm -hmm. You know, this is because I've, 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 I've actually um, been speaking to, I mean, I get attacked from women as well as I do from men, from successful women, because I've challenged them on it. Their view is that the women that aren't making it have a chip on their shoulder. It's their problem. If we can make it, why can't they make it? I've actually been in heated panel discussions with women who attacked me for being condescending. I mean, the, but that's also changing. I mean, I've been an entrepreneur since 1989, and if you look at what it's like now, I'm in a group of uh, women CEOs called CEOs. I'm a member of Golden Seeds and Angel Investment Group. Those things didn't exist. Right. So we just need to find a way how to, how to spread that and kind of make more of that. I, I agree. Uh, what you said basically was that things are changing. Uh, compared to 1989, there's no doubt about that. If you go back another uh, you know, 20 or 30 years before that, women uh, were perceived to be uh, housewives, that they weren't uh, supposed to be in the workforce. Men felt threatened by women. So things are changing. But uh, let me give you, an ex let me give you an ex um, an, um, some data from other research I've been doing. I've also been looking at um, immigrant entrepreneurs and, and uh, the role of, uh, uh, I mean, basically how uh, uh, the tech world has changed with immigration. We did was we analyzed the, uh, we surveyed all the tech startups from 1995 to 2005. We did a survey of uh, 2,000 companies started in that time period in the, in the engineering and tech sector. What we found was 
that 25% of the firms nationwide and 52% of those in Silicon Valley were founded by immigrants, by people who were born abroad. It's an astounding number. Just think about it, that you know, during the tech boom, the greatest uh, days of economic growth uh, for uh, America in recent history, more than half of the people starting these companies were, were, were like me, basically, foreign-born Im, you know, immigrants who didn't understand American values and American culture, who were transplanted to this country. They achieved extraordinary success. Of that group of immigrants, Indians were the dominant uh, company founders. They founded more than the next four groups from the UK, Japan, China, and Taiwan combined. Now, if you go back 30 years to Silicon Valley and looked at the... So Indians founded 15.5% of Silicon Valley firms in that time period. If you went back two decades, three decades, and looked at the proportion of Indian-founded companies, it would be zero. That there were virtually no Indian um, CEOs or CTOs uh, you know, uh, earlier, uh, I mean, about 30 or 40 years ago. We looked at venture capitalists. There was one Indian venture capitalist, Vinod Khosla, and he was called the Indian venture capitalist uh, <laughs> 20 years ago. Right? Now you look in the ranks of venture capitalists, probably 10 to 20% of them are, you know, maybe, I'm, 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 that number may not be right, but at least 10% of them are Indians. So how did this happen? How, uh, please. No. But uh, the data, uh, if you just look at the number of uh, tech companies, in fact, uh, Ben did put together a chart on that. He put together a cluster chart which showed that the majority of them are in Silicon Valley. It's heavily concentrated over there. And then you have a few tech centers where there's startup activity. So the, I'm sorry, the data is available. In fact, Ben can get that for you if you need it. Right. Right. So Elaine? Two things you raised. One is that you say that fairly central to an entrepreneur is risk. And there certainly is a lot of writing about women and risk aversion, so that might be part of it. The second is the data shows that the vast majority start by bootstrapping. Again, you know, we still have wage inequality, and women are just, you know, have uh, less resources. In other writing about female entrepreneurs, generally, not in high tech necessarily, it shows that. Women are greatly undercapitalized. Women started firms versus male started firms, and uh, and basically women keep it going through sweat equity as opposed right. to being able to have access to capital. So I wonder if those two might be. I, I think those are important factors, Elaine. I, I think you're making a very good point over here. But when you're talking about women undercapitalization, it's actually fault because women should be overcapitalized a lot more than men because, as he mentioned, most of the entrepreneurs between men and women are married. And since they usually use a combined capital, chances are your spouse as a male would ha can help you a lot more while you're starting the company than the other way around. So women should be better capitalized because of that, because of the wage inequality. Why is the males earning more than the female? Because that's a fact. Because women take a couple years off to have children. Um, I just wonder, you know, there are two uh, issues to me. One is entrepreneurism and, and uh, having businesses. The other one is getting funded by a VC round early. And so focusing on that piece of it, it seems to me that, you know, when you have someone like Nod Kosla, you know, who goes up and he, he takes care of his own. I mean, the Indian community is good at taking care of their own. I don't know if they're taking care of their own females. Fine. You know, and that's a question I have. And the other piece of it is if you look at the venture community general, those who have become partners in the venture firms, you click through their bios, I mean, how many of them are women? They're all men. So those men are taking care of their own. Yeah. So uh, let's let's talk about that, because I didn't, I didn't finish my uh, discussion yeah. about the Indian community. First of all, I, uh, I agree that uh, uh, the, I mean, in the Indian community, you have uh, women are greatly underrepresented, and you've got the same problem in, you know, with Indian men and Indian women in tech as you do with, uh, with non-Indian or the white uh, Men and women—it's exactly the same problem. That you've got the male Indian, you know, boys—you've got the male boys club versus the old white boys club of the venture capital system. So it's the same problem there. But let's talk about how did Indians rise above this? How do you get people like me, who go from nowhere to, to founding 15.5 percent of of uh, startups over there? Here's what happened: that uh, there were a generation of, uh, of Indians who, who came here in the 70s and the 80s, who started, who came with strong engineering backgrounds who started joining uh, companies as, as engineers and computer programmers and so on, who started achieving success because of their technical competence. 
they started uh, hitting a, you know, a barrier and some of them rose above it. They, when they did do it, they said, there were you know, a whole bunch of them which achieved success. They said, you know, we've, we've made our millions now. It's time for us to start giving back. So they founded a group called the Indus Entrepreneurs TIE, which started actively mentoring. It was initially focused on the South Asian community. They said, look, we're going to go beyond, not only are we going to go beyond the barriers in India, because India is a very segregated company, religion, caste, uh, region, I mean, you name it, and they, you know, people uh, um, discriminate against each other based on that. And uh, um, in India, the concept was you never help each other. You shoot each other's communities down. So they came here and said, let's rise above that. Let's start giving back and mentoring our own kind. So it started with the South Asian community and it broadened to include the American community. And it was active mentoring. What they started doing was they started uh, uh, advising young entrepreneurs. They started providing seed financing. They started uh, um, helping them with their careers. Whatever it took, it was just a matter of giving back without taking. This, this went to this whole concept of the guru and the disciple. They took the role of the guru and started, and started teaching an entire generation of, of entrepreneurs what was going there. And more importantly, what they did was they provided role models. Now, how do I know this? Because I was part of the, uh, the, uh, the following. I mean, I, 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 was, I had founded a technology company um, at, in New York, which we moved to North Carolina. We took it public. I mean, it was 0 to 120 mil revenue in five years, IPO, spectacular success. I had access to Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, Scott McNeely. Everyone would turn, would turn their phone calls. It came time for me to start my second company. I started calling up the local venture capitalists, and they wouldn't take my calls. I was stunned. No one would return my phone calls. I sent them messages. Uh, they would not return my phone calls. Eventually, what I did was I, I started reading about the successful Indian in the Silicon Valley, and I contacted a couple of them, like Vinod Khosla. I, I cold called him. Uh, after my second call, he, uh, he, said, he said he'll, he'll uh, uh, get back to me, and he did get back to me the next day. We spent a couple of hours talking. He, was, he spent time coaching me through the whole system and told me what the obstacles were. And then he gave me introductions to several other people. Eventually, I, I had VCs tripping over each other to give me financing for my company, and, when I, and including the local venture capitalists. And I went back to the local VCs and said, you know, I, I said, I was trying to break down your doors. Why didn't you return my phone calls? What they said was, because you people don't make good CEOs. Right? Literally, that's what the, uh, the local venture capitalist said to me. It was you people. It was the same pattern recognition that I started talking about, John Doerr, that uh, you know, people who look like me don't make CEOs. People who look like me are engineers. I was the CEO yeah. of a company. Right. I was funded uh, by a VC firm. And I very quickly had to hire many people, right. people that I really trusted. I had money in the bank. I had a lot of money. And I thought, I have to use this with people I trust. Who are the people I trust? People that look like me. Right. And I suddenly kind of got it. I call them the pictures on the VC sites of all the guys. Those are my porno pictures. I go from <laughs> site to site. They're all men. And as my dad in business told me, they all look the same without their clothes on. Right. <laughs> and I, I would like someday to go and see some women on those sites. Right. But the whole notion, but, but, if but someone I, gives you a lot of money, right. you're going to hire the people you trust. Right. And the people you trust, I think there's also like the older guy helping the young guy become him. Yeah. I don't look like the older guy. Right. And if an older guy helps me out, does his wife say, who the hell is that? Mm -hmm. Does she have, say, I mean, uh, there's a lot mm -hmm. of sociology yeah. around it, I'm sure you, you're I, mean, I, I think she's hitting the nail on the head over And here. if I'm yeah. going to trust somebody with a yeah. million dollars, I want to know they can do it. Right. If I'm a guy, I'm going to hire a guy. Yeah. I mean, duh. That, that's the dynamic at play over here. I agree the, with that, but there's yeah. one thing that's wrong with that. The thing that's wrong with that is only one in ten VC-backed firms actually make it, partially because of the way they invest and the way they manage. So we spend all this time trying to figure out what's wrong with them instead of creating a new model that's better, that supports what we want to do in nurturing all kinds of businesses. It could be that one, only one in ten VC firms make it because of the problem we just talked about here, because they're not funding the women. They're leaving out half the population. But women's ideas aren't as important as men's ideas. I agree. What are you thinking? <laughs> I agree, but I mean, come on. we have a systematic problem over here. So the so question someone asked before was, you know, what's the problem over here? I think it's a systematic problem in the United States against women. The deck is stacked against them right now. And how do I, th how, how would I solve it? The same way that my comrades did, the way, same way that my Indian friends did, the same way I did, is to mentor each other. We, that's what we did. Actively, in the Thai community, we made it a point to help each other. We knew there was a problem. We would openly talk about the discrimination. I wasn't the only one who would tell the story about uh, you know, my people. 
all of the other people in the Thai group openly had discussions about the fact, hey, that we're disadvantaged here. There were no other venture capitalists. So what they started doing was they started forming their own angel funds, and then they started moving into venture capital. Once they achieved success, they now became, it now became easy for Indians to get funding. Today, if you're an Indian, if you look like me, you're going to get your phone calls returned before the white guy. <laughs> because, because people like me are perceived to be you know, uh, you know, good um, CEOs now. That's how much things have changed within 20 years. I mean, look at the progress that, that one committee made. Have you looked at the outliers who have, who are women in tech, who have made it, and what can we teach about them to the people who want to be? The question is about uh, the uh, the women who made it teaching the others. A lot more of that needs to happen than, than is happening. And this is one of the issues I've had. You know, as I said earlier, that I've been taking fire even from women, because I've been pretty vocal about the fact that successful women are not helping other uh, helping others uh, rise. They're not, you know, pulling the people the women behind them. Because again, I've been asking why this happens. It happens because women are afraid of helping others because then they'll be afraid, accused of discriminating, and and you know, helping their gal friends. And so on and so on. Or they want to be more like the guys. Or learning, the, or losing their turf. Or losing their turf. Whatever it might be, there's a lot of factors. <laughs> there, there are a lot of factors that play over the here. Other jobs we do, we all do two, three, or four jobs. Right. Sorry, but so in your, if, let's say, a fantasy or vision of um, preventative care, shall we say, at early, early age, what do you think could happen in the schools? to try to begin to talk about, address entrepreneurship at a very early age? What would your vision be? You know, I, I wrote an article about, uh, um, uh, in TechCrunch, uh, titled, Can Mina uh, Start the uh, the Indian Google? What it looked at, what I, I was, this was an eye-opening. It was almost a religious experience for me when I went to India. There was this uh, girl, Saima Hassan. Her father is uh, one of the most successful venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. These people must be worth $100 million. Saima was brought up in the United States. She went to Stanford, uh, 22 years of age. She went, uh, when, she, when she was uh, 21 to India, she went uh, basically and stayed there for a few months with her relatives. And she started noticing that, her, that, you know, that the daughter and the son of her maid seemed very intelligent. And she started saying, well, you know, what about these people? Aren't they human beings too? Can't they be, achieve success? And she launched an experiment. She founded what's called Roshni Academy. She, what she did was that uh, she got her father to, and, and some friends to put some money into the bank for her to fund um, a, a, you know, a, a group, and she decided to go and live in India for two years. So what, she, what they've been doing basically is going to the poorest of the poor slums um, and going to school in those slums and identifying women, girls basically, typically you know, uh, 12 to 14 years of age or 15 years of age, who are at the top of their classes, who have aptitude, but who will never, uh, you know, otherwise make it. So, and, and what they did was, what they do is that they bring them into this boot camp type of thing, six weeks at a time. They do two or three of these, and they teach them social skills. They start off by, by getting them to speak in English, because in India you learn in English in school, but you never speak it, and, and they don't have the confidence to, um, to speak it. They, they, what they do basically is they teach these girls the basics about communicating. They teach them things like hygiene, how do you sit at a table and eat with a fork and a knife. They teach them about uh, self-confidence. They have them play uh, team-building games. The same stuff you would see in um, uh, you know, corporate outing events, team-building, rah, 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 we can change the world, and so on. I went there in week three of this to see the girls, and then I went there in week, uh, uh, week five, and I was blown away with how much of a transformation that happened. I saw the videos of some of these girls in day one. They would basically be sitting there very shy, very afraid, not wanting to uh, speak to anyone. They were unconfident. Their parents were going to get them married off because girls are liabilities in India. This came very, from very poor families. Many of them were basically you know, already engaged to be married and so on. The girls were liability. In one case, the, I met the father also. The father was a complete drunkard. He, you know, he, he had two daughters and he felt his, they, they, no matter what, how much money he earned, he could never get out of poverty. So he would just drink his life away and he would beat the daughters up and the, and the grandmother and the mother. I mean, it was, it was just abusive. What happened was that these girls started gaining a, a level of confidence I've never seen before. When I went back for the graduation party in week six, they were talking about how they're going to change the world. One wanted to be a lawyer, another one wanted to be a computer programmer, another one said, I want to start a great tech company. I said, a Google? She said, yes, I'm going to start a Google, I'm going to change the world. And their parents over there were talking about how proud they were of their daughters. The, 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 fa the father literally stopped drinking because he said, you know, my daughter is going, to, is going to earn all the money that my son would have earned. He's going to lift us out of poverty. So what happened was that these girls, 
develop the confidence to change the world. I mean, I could show you videos of them. I actually posted them in my article in TechCrunch. If you, you know, what you should do is do a, a search on um, my last name and uh, do a search on Meena and Google, Vibhadva, Meena, Google, and watch the videos on, on YouTube. I guarantee you'll be astonished at how, uh, you know, uh, amazing, the, uh, what a change happened to these girls. How do you spell Meena, M-I-N-A? M-E-E-N-A. M-E-N-A? M -E -E Mina. What's the school called? Or the Roshni Academy. -E but you know, the lesson over here is that if you can take girls from the uh, most miserable slums in India and teach them the confidence to change the world, they were all now determined to go to school. Their, their parents, so Roshni will give them some minor scholarship, but each of the parents has pledged to put their girls to school, let them complete their education, and the girls are determined to become uh, uh, major successes in society. And, and these girls will. I'm a bit confused about your story. I thought in India, if you're at the top of your class and you belong to untouchable class and you have priority to go to college, why would they make No, but what happens is there's a lot of other facts. When you're, these are really third-rate schools that, um, you know, no one from those schools gets admission anywhere. We're not talking about the, you know, the schools for the middle class where you, where you if you're at the top of the class, you'll get into the IITs and so on. We're talking about schools that are so low on the, uh, on the scale the, the, the vast majority of these, these people are going to become fruit sellers or, or cleaners or sweepers or whatever. Really be, well below the poverty line. Right. You know, there's some competing narratives that I think are going on here in America that I'd just like to kind of bring into the conversation. I mean, recently, the Atlantic Monthly ran a um, cover story called The End of Men. And, you know, in uh, foreign policy, uh, you know, last fall, they ran sort of The End of Macho. And then, a, you know, sort of sidebar piece was, you know, our father's necessary. I mean, it's this whole notion that boys are now kind of disappearing. Their skills aren't wanted anymore. The labor force is designed now Those for are the what the skills I get, by the are. Way. Um, what? Those are the type of emails I get. Yeah, well, this is, so this is sort of a narrative that's One, one email accused here. me of uh, trying to work towards the extermination of, of white males from American society. Right. Well, this is a <laughs> countervailing narrative that's going on, and the comments that you find on these are just similar to some yeah. of the things that you've done. The other sort of portrait or narrative I'd like to point out is I had a conversation the other day with a woman who got her MBA from Stanford. She now lives in Silicon Valley in one of those communities. Right. Her husband is, you know, kind of an entrepreneur, kind of out in the tech world, as she said, not hit it yet, so they're not among sort of the rich. But here she's a woman, she's working, she has children, she's out there, she works for the Monitor Group, doing traveling all over the country, et cetera. But when she goes back home to her neighborhood in Silicon Valley, she can't find one other woman who's working. Yeah. They all have three or four children. They all did get their MBAs, but they aren't working any longer. So when you talk about the men who are hiring in these firms, their notion of women is very much what they see at home, what they have in their community. And for a woman to go into that community and take on that role is a very isolating and difficult experience for her. I, so I there's a dimension of the personal I agree. that's very much a part of this dynamic, I think, that you're talking about. I wrote about. a Business Week article in which I highlighted the fact that there are more Indian women CEOs in finance in India who are the CEOs of banks in India than there are on, on Wall Street. That uh, there, are no heads of, there are no women heads of Wall Street firms. What's going on here? When they can make it in India, which is one of the most difficult societies out there, why can't they make it in the United States? There are lots of issues here. To, to get women early enough, so I created a class for kindergarten children. So I have a six-year-old. I taught her a kindergarten class. The teacher asked me to come in and talk about what is an entrepreneur. And so I, the only thing I could think about as to how to communicate that to kindergartners was to create a class where they actually invented something. That's a great idea. So I created a class where they invented board games. And what was interesting, you know, it would have been nice to study this, but in each we divided the class into four groups of like six kids. And in each of the groups, the girls took the lead in getting the project done. And without the girls' skills, which are way advanced at that age in terms of verbal and communication. And so I think if we start at kindergarten to like teach them what it is, they won't get to the end of college before they realize they might like it. You know, I want to, sh I want to share that video if I can, because you have to see these, these girls in action. Because I, um, while you talk, I'm going to try to load it up. I, I assume we have internet access here. Because, like I said, there was just such an amazing uh, thing to see how girls can, can be motivated to change the world and, and, and do so much. 
No, I haven't. You have to read. It's a book about the fact that women don't ask for what they need in their lives, money, jobs, positions, often, because there's a great deal of social sanction against women who do ask and do get things. Right. It's, it's a mind-blowing book. It's about women don't ask. And there's good reasons that they don't. Women <laughs> don't ask is important. So your last slide, you showed um, women going into graduate programs and into undergraduate programs and how much that's changed over the last 30 years. Is that, should that hearten us and make us think that, you know, give it another 20 years when these women hit 41, they'll, they'll become think, entrepreneurs or sadly, is there I more that needs to be done? I don't think it'll done? happen on its own because the numbers are working, going in the wrong direction. That's what the problem is. Can we, uh, the uh, screen isn't working, but I'm wondering if we can, All right, good. Then let me bring up the right article. Because I really accept... Oh, I see. Exactly. Uh, <coughs> so, sorry for the diversion, but you can see how, uh, how touched I was about these... Uh, let me... This girl uh, comes from uh, uh, from a family. There's no sound. My persuading medical standard with science, and uh, I'm a former student of Roshni. This year, I'm a TA. I'm appointed as a TA. I'm respectfully appointed as a TA, and Roshni really has helped me. I mean, I must say that Roshni has changed my life because when I came here last year. My father went through a trauma and he don't want me to study because we don't have that much money. He don't have that much money that, that he declared me and my sister to stay at home and not study further. So I was like, I have no excuse how to talk, how I can convince my father to let me study. But I, when I came here in Roshni, Roshni has helped me. I feel how important studies are for me. And I go through two weeks program and hopefully, I mean, I, I was, uh, I got top two scholarship and I was uh, awarded as a leader among 100 girls. And it was the last year of Roshni. I show my certificates to my dad. And he said, I'm very proud of you, my child. You really make me proud. And I said, Father, Papa, don't you want me to be always proud of you? He said, yeah, I want always to be proud of you. And he, get, he got an idea that I really want to study. And study means a lot for me. So I talked to him, and I tried to convince him. I said that, Papa, if you let me stay at home, I'll be like an empty room. And I feel that I'm very talented. If you let me study, I can do many things, and I want to be a lawyer. I'll make you proud, and one day you will feel like I'm the best. I'm the best child among my sibling. And he himself said when he um, when he saw my sibling, he, not talk, he um, said that you know, my child, you she make me so proud, Don't and herself. you prove to be the best among your all sibling. And that's really a biggest achievement Her for me. That Roshni I was talking about. has would helped the me, and Rajeshri Ma'am really convinced my father, <laughs> and some of them also talked to, talk to him. So that right now I'm studying and I'm in 12th standard. That's really a big achievement for me. Right. Okay. What do you want to be ultimately? What's your ultimate goal? Uh, actually, I want to be a lawyer, and there's another goal also. I want to be a doctor also, BDS. BDS. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I'm doing my uh, studies with science, so I take it as a, another option that maybe if I won't be a lawyer, because who knows what what will happen next. So I keep it as a optional goal, but really I want to be a lawyer. Actually, but I want. Why to do you want to be a lawyer? I. I yeah, <laughs> let me. I was oh, sorry. Sana, tell me about yourself. I have no excuse how to talk. Uh, let me show you another video. But it's like I said, now, what has Roshni done for you? Roshni gave me a lot of success and uh, she gave me so much confidence. Family. And uh, she was supposed to be married uh, off. To speak in a in front of. If she had not done this thing, she would be right and, now. Uh, uh, um, you know, married to some poor uh, uh, laborer in uh, Delhi. So what's your, what? Hesitation. My hesitation was completely... Mm, and and uh, 
my soul was uh, uh, able to speak in different of many peoples. And, uh, and, uh, I speak English in front of many peoples. Did you speak English before? No, I hesitate. Right. Speak so come to come to speak my own. Right. So what's your goal in life now? What do you want to be when you when you grow up? What, uh, what do you want to be? What's your goal in life? My goal in life, I'm going to become a computer engineer and also a math teacher. A math teacher and a computer engineer? Yes. Sir. Right. Wow. <laughs> Good. Then, how do your parents feel about this? Very beautiful. My mom and my father. Feel anyway, you get the idea. What I'm saying is that if you can take girls like this and give them the encouragement, literally these girls. I mean, actually, I've seen the videos when they walked in there. They were so down on themselves. That their belief was that they could not succeed. That their life is going to be one of, of being married, maybe being a laborer, working on uh, some construction sites in, in New Delhi. But this is what, what you, they can be turned into within weeks. Yeah. Well, what I find interesting with this is a very much parallel what you're reading about now in Afghanistan, where finally the military commanders, Petraeus and uh, you know, the general before him, I'm now even forgetting his name, <laughs> but the guy who was gone, I mean, the one that they were turning to was Greg Mortensen you know, who wrote Three Cups of Tea. Right. And they were now getting him in as a consultant to try to understand two things. What the schools were doing in those communities, 120 schools that he set up for girls right. in those communities, but also as a link for the military to understand how to communicate with the tribal leaders on the kinds of issues that have to do with the role of girls, you know, in the life, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very interesting how that's yeah. coming but through. But you don't have to go that. all the way to Afghanistan. Where I live in Palo Alto, you have East Palo Alto, which is yep. a mile away. Yep. And you see the same, you know, depressed, yep. uh, this, you know, demoralized uh, girls and boys who basically believe there's no future for them. Right? So if we can, you know, if Roshni can do this to his girls in India, why can't we fix the problem over here where we have all the resources in the world? I mean, what, what's holding us back? Okay, why is it that women feel like they're second-class citizens in the United States? Question? Uh, everyone. <laughs> uh, so I've been very vocal and outspoken about these issues lately. And often in response, I'm told, well, there are already pre-existing programs that mentor women, that serve to help them get investment, um, that are doing all those types of things that I want to do in the field of engaging more women. Are they working? The program's already out there, and if so, why not? And what can be done as a result? Because Fine. there really are a lot of programs that are trying to address this issue. They're not necessarily collaborating. I was at the We Own It Summit as well, and I know there was some talk of collaborating more. But. Yeah, we're probably throwing billions at the problem, getting nothing, getting nothing out of it. Fine. Yes. I think also we have to make sure that we don't ignore structural inequality in terms of gender, race, and class that exists on a institutional level, it's not just a matter of empowering young women to think more about math and science. There are a lot of very empowered young women who are very interested in these issues. The problem is that there are social, economic, and political forces that privilege particular types of experiences, generally those of heterosexual white men over others. So until some of those structural issues are addressed, like the pay gap, the gap in child care, the lack of support for child care, those types of things, we're not those have to be addressed in order to have, in order for things to change in, in particular realms of business. Sorry, just to clarify, I was wondering if you had a thought as to why pre-existing programs haven't had a big gender impact. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. I mean, you've got to realize, uh, six months ago, I, I wouldn't have been able to even talk about this. I didn't realize there was an issue. Okay. I was one of the, uh, the Indian uh, Thai guys who was totally out of touch with the fact that there's an issue for women. It's only since I've... Um, started looking into the issue when I realized it's such a big problem here. That's why I'm so vocal about it. Question? You had mentioned uh, women's involvement in the open source community, and this is something that I actually had a conversation with someone about a couple days ago about the extremely small population of women in the open source community, right. and considering that that community does view itself as a community, I'm wondering if you have an opinion or a thought about the extremely low population of women I, th I think the, the problem is that there are few women to start with in the tech community, and those that are don't have the confidence to, uh, to venture out and do things like that. You know, Jennifer pa Palka is doing this uh, group called Code for America, which is really into open source, trying to use, uh, uh, you know, apply all the energy towards, uh, towards uh, government and so on. 
and she's trying to have um, you know as many women as part of that as she can. But yeah, there's a problem there. I don't know what to tell you. How do you spell her last name? P A L K A. A L K A. Yeah, I, I could be wrong, but the code for America, if you do a search on code for America, okay, you'll find her. Okay. There are also studies on women's involvement in open source. Mm -hmm. It goes into the community to identify some of the issues. It's one of those situations where it's a very complicated problem, so it's not an easy answer. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different factors that go into the role of involvement. One of them is definitely the lack of women in computer science and health in general. Second, some of the open source communities have sort of some cultural issues that dissuade women from joining. So it, it's, it, it would be, if people could fix it, they would absolutely yeah. the answer, but um, I can look up some sites. Yeah, the, uh, the Women's Coalition just recently met and they came out with a bunch of recommendations, <laughs> but it, it really did seem that they were a lot of small solutions to very limited problems, as opposed to actually attempting to attack the root issues. What were some of the solutions? I mean, very basic, more fellowships for women in open source, encouraging math and science education for girls. I mean, they were very basic and not really, we're going to go in and confront the leaders and perceived leaders of this community in how they interact with women in an everyday environment. And I think, I think that's one of the, yeah. the structural problems that I was talking about, yeah. like a, a general kind of attitude. All these big communities and then drilling down into the I think you also see a very similar thing in hacker communities right now. Yeah. Like famously, if you go to 20, um, right, 26 Hope years. or DEF CON, <laughs> one of the big hacker conferences, if you're a woman, you will be assumed to be somebody's fault. Mm -hmm. Right? The idea that you will actually be a female participant is something that is foreign to a lot of community members. So you have these reinforcing cultural norms that then continue to keep women out. Yes. What's this, uh, Just if anybody has nothing to do at 6.30, there is an event tonight at um, the Microsoft Research Center, um, and a woman named Bettina something or other is actually... Hmm? Bettina Yeah, she's Bettina. pitching um, her company kind of as a way to show pitching to a VC. So if Microsoft curious, Research Center at 6.30? Yeah, if anybody's right. curious. Okay. You know, I look around this table and I would just note that I'm old enough to remember um, the 60s and the 70s and what it was like to be a young woman then. And uh, in the mid-70s, I was a plaintiff in a very well-known federal court case that ended up giving access to women sports writers to go into locker rooms and interview players. I took on baseball. Wow. And I beat them. First person to ever beat Bowie Kuhn in a, in a lawsuit. Anyway, all I want to say is to that... Women went to interview men? I mean... Pardon? Women journalists wanted not to interview men? Not to, they did not have the same access as male reporters to interview the athletes. Wow. So we went to federal court. Interestingly, the judge in that case was a woman named Constance Baker Motley, first African-American woman ever appointed to the federal bench by Lyndon Johnson in the 60s. It was a very interesting moment. What I'm hearing around this table and in this discussion is that during those years and the memories of those years is that Girls today, young women today, don't like what they read about the way women handled themselves back then because women confronted things. They were sometimes perceived as sort of aggressive and ugly and pushy. The name feminist was given to them. It's a word that many young women don't want to use today because it has all of these connotations. And what I'm hearing in this discussion is a sense of the good girls. You know, we'll kind of, each of us make it on our own plate, you know, and we won't necessarily get together and confront what you talked about in some of these institutional things. The 70s were about confronting the institutions that held women back in that generation. And there's been a lull. There's been almost a ceasing of a willingness to do that, and I think it covers a lot of the conversation we're doing today. So I just wanted to kind of bring a perspective of someone who has gray hair, who's kind of been through the trenches, who's watching what's happening today, taking in what you're saying, and really thinking hard about what can happen if the young women in this room and other rooms will really step forward together, you know, and not be afraid to confront. What I've said is you should learn from the Indians. If we people can do it, my yeah. people can do it, so can yours. Right. Oh. One last comment or question. I, I have a comment. I think that there are so many problems that need to be fixed. Kind of, 
I think there's so many problems that need to be fixed. To somehow have uh, minorities or women on the sidelines is just, it's abominable. It's terrible. It's like a resource that is not used. And if everything was so perfect, fine. <laughs> we'll sit on the sidelines, but it's not. Yeah, Especially in the Middle East, I think a woman and a mother's sensibility mm -hmm. in those countries could be revolutionary. And if that's not happening, we all are not doing our work. And there's so much work to do. So that's why it, it really hurts me to think how much could be done to benefit all men, all women, all races, and it's not happening. And we can do it. I think Haley summed up the meeting so. quite well. Uh, thank you. Thank you.